chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with an audio adaptation of frightening fiction about deadly desires. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. And tonight, and every other Wednesday night, I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. That's right, folks. The Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast is now airing two times a week for twice the terror, with me hosting on Wednesdays. Tonight, to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Keisto Healy, is yours truly, Paul J. McSorley. Now get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our tale this evening is written by Keisto Healy and is performed by me, Paul J. McSorley. In it, we meet a young man who would give just about anything to obtain a certain mask in a costume shop. In fact, he almost does. Now, without further ado, I present to you The Costume Shop. Bobby stood in front of the shop window. The lights were out within the building, but he could see the shapes of the costumed mannequins within. There was every kind of hero and monster he could imagine. He saw wings and horns, swords and axes, robes and capes, gloves and masks. They were all around the store just waiting to be bought, to be put on and worn, and taken home. There had never been a store like this in the small town of Kellyville, West Virginia. Bobby had hoped for one, wished for it even. And now... It was like a dream come true. He couldn't wait for it to open. He had a few more days and the excitement left him tingling like electricity. He felt like most kids did on Christmas morning. He couldn't sleep. He couldn't think about anything else. As soon as he heard the store was coming, Bobby was ready. He stood out front and watched as the trucks came and the people loaded boxes inside. He watched with anticipation as the pumpkins and clowns were carried by him on hand trucks. He got a paper route and mowed lawns for his neighbors. Bobby did anything he could to earn and save money for when the shop opened. Two more days, he said as he put his palms on the glass. That pain stood between him and the costumes and decorations within. He could almost touch them. He was so close. I heard sometimes they open early if they get everything set up in time, his friend Arlo said. Bobby kept his palms on the glass when he turned his head to look at the other boy. I hope that's true. I can't wait. I want to be the scariest monster in there for Halloween this year. I won't be something funny or cool. I don't like scary stuff, Arlo said. Well, I bet they have it all, Bobby said excitedly. A car pulled up at the curb, blowing thick plumes of foul-smelling exhaust into the air. 
Bobby groaned as soon as he smelled it. He knew whose car it was. He took his hands from the glass and turned around to face the idling vehicle. You got come home, his brother Marco said from the driver's seat. Time to go. See you tomorrow, Arlo said with a wave before hopping on his bicycle and pedaling away. Bobby turned back to the store window and gazed longingly at the products that would soon be available for him to choose from. Come on, his brother said. Just another minute, Bobby said. He thought he saw someone back there in the dark. He supposed it could have been an animatronic that was already powered up to move. But what if it was one of the workers? If he could get their attention, maybe they'd let him come in and preview the stuff before the store's official opening. How cool would that be if he could get an exclusive look? Bobby! Marco revved his engine and the muffler coughed more smoke into the air. Bobby cringed and waved his hand in front of his face, coughing. Why couldn't you just give me a minute? It's not even open yet, dude. Just get in the car. Mom's got dinner on the stove. You know she'll be pissed if we're not there by the time it's on the table. Bobby huffed and took his hand from the window ever so slowly, his fingers peeling away until the tip of his finger finally broke contact. Frowning, he turned to leave. When he did, he saw the movement again in the darkness at the back of the store. He was thinking about it when he rounded the car and got into the passenger seat. You're so dramatic, his brother said as he gunned the engine and the car peeled away from the costume shop. You don't understand. I've waited forever for this, Bobby said. He turned in his seat to look out the back window at the store getting smaller and smaller in the background. And you can go in and buy stuff when it opens like everybody else, Bob. You don't have to be a weirdo and stand up front touching the glass like it's a long-lost lover or something. That's freaking weird, man. Bobby frowned, but he knew it wouldn't get him anywhere to argue with his brother. Marco was thick-headed. His opinions were like an impenetrable fortress. He chose to change the subject instead. What do you think you're going to be for Halloween? I don't know, dude. Right now, I can't think past Mom's meatloaf. I'm going to be a monster. I don't know what kind yet, but it's going to be scary. I know that much. I'm going to be the scariest monster they have in that store. How much money do you make slinging papers, dude? Those costumes are expensive. I don't think you realize. The best ones in there are going to cost a fortune. I did okay, Bobby said, staring out the window as rain started to fall and soak the awnings of the stores they passed. I can get something good. I will. Whatever you say, little bro, I just don't want you to get all disappointed. I won't. Just wait. I'm going to get my costume when you're not there, and I'm going to scare the crap out of you. Marco laughed. <laughs> Give it your best, he said. I will. Marco was right to be excited about the meatloaf. It was delicious, but Bobby couldn't focus on it. He moved it around on his plate with his fork as he thought about all the different costumes and decorations that could be in that shop. He was also wondering who he saw in the back of the store. Was it the owner? Did they wear a mask? He was willing to bet whoever they were, they were the most interesting person he'd ever meet. Bobby thought he would like to open a costume shop like that someday. Every time his mother or brother called his attention to the fact that he wasn't actually eating, Bobby would smile and shove a forkful into his mouth. He would mumble something about it being delicious and give his mother the thumbs up. Meatloaf was his dad's favorite dish, so every time she made it, his mother would set an extra plate at the table despite the fact that the man had been gone for years already. Bobby thought it was a little strange. Even if his dad came to dinner as a ghost, he was pretty sure ghosts couldn't eat meatloaf or anything for that matter, but he didn't say anything because he knew it made his mom feel better. That was good enough for him. Bobby did wish he could ask his father what he was going to be for Halloween or what he thought Bobby should be. Bobby had been little when his dad passed, but his mom told him 
that his father had loved Halloween as much as Bobby did. It would have been cool to be able to share that. His brother didn't seem to care about it at all, and his mother was too busy trying to keep everything running to have time for any fun stuff. He promised himself he would keep working and start helping her once he had bought his costume. As he cleared the dishes from the table, rinsed them, and put them in the dishwasher, Bobby chewed on his lip and wondered if he could get a job at the costume shop. He couldn't imagine anything better than that. Then he worried that if the shop was hiring, it would be first come first serve for the position. He couldn't help but wonder if whoever he had seen might still be there. He couldn't just run out and check. His mother would yell at him to come back and probably ground him for a week, and then he would miss the grand opening too. He would be crushed. So Bobby waited until his mother went to bed. He listened for his brother. He knew Marco wouldn't go to sleep for a while. He always stayed up late watching movies, playing video games, and listening to music. Bobby didn't need him to go to sleep, though. He just needed him to be preoccupied enough that he didn't notice Bobby hadn't gone to sleep. When he heard the TV going, he crept to Marco's room and peeked through the jam of the open door. His brother was sitting on his bed, legs folded under him and controller in hand blasting aliens. Satisfied, Bobby seized the opportunity and crept by. He knew which boards creaked and avoided them skillfully. He did the same on his way down the steps. Bobby knew he couldn't go out the front door. It was heavy and loud and would most certainly alert his mother to his plan. He moved quietly through the house to the kitchen and out the back door where he grabbed his bicycle. He walked it to the road and passed the front of his own house, nervously looking up at the windows as he went. Then he climbed on and pedaled hard, speeding down the road. At last the rain had stopped. It was damp and chilly, but it would have been worse if it was coming down on him. It would also be harder to explain when his mother found his soaking wet clothes. Now that the storm itself was over, he just had to avoid stepping in the puddles and everything would be just fine. Bobby was at the shop in minutes. He peered through the glass again, searching for signs of movement within. It was so dark and hard to see, but several things were turning in slow circles and moving up and down now. Maybe that was the work of whoever he had seen earlier. Perhaps they had been setting things up, bringing life to the place. Just because he couldn't see them didn't mean they weren't there. Bobby moved to his left and knocked on the door several times. Then he moved back and watched the dark room through the window again as he waited. He could have sworn he saw something or someone moving around the back of the store again, but it was too dark to tell if it was a person or not. Bobby frowned. If it was a person, surely they would have at least come up front to tell him they were closed or waved him away when he was knocking, right? Maybe they couldn't see him any better than he could see them. He wondered if all the moving animatronics might make it hard for them to hear him as well. He bit his fingernail and wondered if he would have to give up and go home. Disappointed, Bobby walked his bike past the shop to the corner, but he didn't go further. He looked back again and thought, Maybe there's a back door. It's worth a try, right? One last try before I go home. Bobby wheeled his bike as he turned down the side street and searched for the back of the shop. He went down the alley behind the store. It smelled bad and there was a lot of trash, but he tried not to think about it. The doors were all labeled for the shops on that street. All but one. Since the costume shop only just arrived, Bobby assumed that had to be the one. He lifted his hand and rapped on the door. Then he waited, as he did before. When nothing happened, disappointment hit him again. Bobby sighed, kicked the can that rolled across the ground, grabbed his bicycle, and started out of the alley. He heard a creak and looked back to see the door open, yellow light filtering out into the darkness of the alley. Hello? Bobby said, realizing in the moment that he actually felt a little bit nervous. He began to wonder if this was a bad idea. Hello! An enthusiastic voice said back from the open door. They sounded friendly enough, but it bothered him that he couldn't see them. Who's there? 
he asked. A thin man with a long mustache and a monocle, gelled hair covering one eye and showing a heavily pierced ear, jumped out of the open doorway, landing in the alley and splashing into a puddle. A pleasure to meet you, young man. My name's Merrick, Merrick Falcone. And you have a name too? Or should I just call you the boy who knocks a lot? Bobby, my name's Bobby. Merrick clapped his hands. Well, Bobby, you came a knocking, so would you like to come in and see the store? The boy's eyes lit up. Would I ever? He said. Merrick stepped aside and waved a hand at the open door. After you, then, he said. All Bobby's fear went away in an instant. He was getting exactly what he wanted, an early exclusive preview of the store's contents before anyone else in town got to see them. He couldn't wait to tell Arlo. He was going to be so jealous. Maybe he could come back with Arlo tomorrow. But tonight was his. It was a dream come true. He leaned his bicycle against a dumpster and hurried down the alley, not even caring that his shoes were splashing through filthy puddles or old rainwater. When he reached the door, he looked over at Merrick, whose smile was as wide as his mustache. He waved at the door once more. Bobby smiled and nodded at him and then hurried past into the building. It wasn't until he was inside with Merrick coming in behind him that Bobby stopped to wonder why there was so much light coming out the open door when it had seemed so dark when he was looking through the front window. Now the light was bright enough to be blinding. Merrick shut the door and the bright yellow light blinked out like it had been a candle on a birthday cake. There was a series of flicks and the fluorescent lights of the store blinked and buzzed as they came to life. Bobby looked at him with curiosity and confusion. If you just turn the lights on now, why was it so bright before? Just a little something I'm working on, Bobby, my friend. Now, go enjoy yourself. See what my shop has to offer. Bobby had felt a little wary with the strange light, but that fear blinked out just like the light did when Merrick spoke those words. He turned and looked at the store. It was all that he had hoped for, and more. He gasped in delight and ran forward, skidding to a halt before a life-size mummy that was turning back and forth with its arms up. Wow, Bobby said in awe before running to the next one. This is so cool. Thank you, Merrick said joyfully as he strolled behind him. I've built it all myself. Over years, of course. Slowly but surely, my collection has grown. It's incredible, Bobby said, stopping before a werewolf that was frozen mid-pounce. Is this a costume or just a prop? Can't you be this? You can be anything you want, my dear boy. Tell me what you would like to be. I want to be a monster, Bobby said. The scariest monster you've got. How delightful! Merrick answered with a grin that made his mustache twitch. He took a bow like he was on stage doing magic tricks or acting in a play of some kind. I think I've got just the thing, he said when he righted himself. You do? Bobby asked with excitement. Oh, yes. You keep looking around and I'll go fetch it. Okay. Bobby watched him scamper off with a dance to his step, and he chuckled. He hoped Marco was wrong, and the costume Merrick went to get wasn't too expensive. Maybe he could make a deal, work it off or something. The guy seemed nice enough. Bobby decided not to worry about it and to focus on enjoying the experience he had waited so long for. He walked the aisles and inspected the bats and clowns, the jack-o'-lanterns and cats. He looked at the masks and weapons, some of which dripped fake blood, while others glowed in the dark. It was amazing, everything he had hoped for and more. He couldn't believe he was there. It had to be late, the middle of the night, 
and he was perusing an unopened costume shop. He wished his father could see him now. Bobby was shaking hands with a cackling skeleton who stared at him through bright green light-up eyes when Merrick finally returned. Sorry, it took a minute, Merrick said as he strolled Bobby's way. I had to find the one I was looking for. I'm ashamed to say my skills at organizing are not as good as my store. But don't worry, I found it. I've got it right here. What do you think? Bobby's eyes went wide when he took in the mask in the man's hand. It was absolutely terrifying. There were horns and bumps, a drooping eye from a black socket, and another eye with a red iris. It had cuts in it that oozed some kind of slimy yellow pus. There were too many teeth for the mouth, and the extras punched their way through the cheeks of the horrid face. One ear was half missing, and the other was long and pointed. There was an X branded into the bony forehead. Wow, Bobby said. He took the thing in his hands. This will scare everybody. Yes, it will, Merrick said with one of his patented smiles. Bobby's fingers ran lovingly over the rubber mask. He squirmed like he had felt an actual surge of power come from it, but he was sure that it was just his own excitement getting the best of him. How much is it? He asked. Oh, why, this one is free, Bobby. It's already yours. It always was. Bobby wasn't sure what he meant by that, but he shrugged and said, Thank you. I've been waiting forever for this. You sure have, Merrick said. I hope it's everything you wished it to be. It will be. I just know it, Bobby told him with obvious excitement and enthusiasm. Merrick clapped a hand down on the boy's shoulder. All right, run along now. You can see the rest when everyone else does. You need to get home before your mother realizes you're gone. And Bobby, it's not my place to tell someone what to do with their own hard-earned dollars, but since you got your mask for free... You might want to consider giving her the money you saved for it. Yeah, Bobby said. In a blink, he was back outside in the dark alley. When he looked up, the door to the store was closed. He would have questioned whether or not he had ever actually been inside had he not been holding that terrifying monster mask in his hands. He wondered how Merrick knew about his mom and the money he had saved. Maybe he'd mentioned it and forgot, but that wasn't like him. Then again, he was really excited, so he wasn't his normal self. He shrugged it off and walked over to where he left his bicycle, absentmindedly stepping in more mud puddles as he went. When he got to his bike, Bobby frowned. He didn't know if he could hold the mask and the handles at the same time. He didn't want to drop it and dirty it. He had just gotten it. He considered walking the bike home so he could hold both, one in each hand, but ultimately decided it would take him far too long to get home that way. The easiest solution was just to wear the mask. It wasn't quite Halloween yet, but maybe he could get some early scares in if anybody was out late at night as he rode by. He couldn't wait to scare his brother. Marco was going to scream for sure. Bobby pulled the mask over his head. It fit okay, but it was a little tight. He found it hard to breathe out of his nose. It was like he had a cold. He didn't need to wear it for long, though. He could take it off when he got home. He climbed onto his bicycle and realized it was hard to see. He could only see out of the intact eye. Through the other was only darkness. I'll have to cut a slit in this one before I wear it for Halloween, or I'll probably trip and hurt myself he thought as he pedaled away carefully. It was strange trying to ride with only one eye. He felt off balance and his bike swayed back and forth. It was good that he didn't live far. When he got home, Bobby walked his bike around back, doing his best to be quiet. His one blind eye led to him tripping over something and falling into a rake, which in turn fell into the garbage cans, which happened to be metal and empty at the moment. The crash was obnoxiously loud 
and made Bobby freeze in his tracks. He was staring at the house, his heart thundering in his chest. Why would they make a mask he couldn't see out of? What a bad design. He had to go into the house whether he liked it or not. If the noise woke his mom, hiding outside wouldn't help. She'd probably already checked both boys' rooms. Grumbling, Bobby went to the back door. He opened it and was immediately met with terrified screaming. Bobby almost fell back out of the door. It didn't make things better when his mother, in her nightgown, started swinging a frying pan at him. She never stopped screaming. That meant she was going to wake up Marco too. Stop! He yelled. It's me! Mom! It's me! She didn't hear him over her own panicked screams and continued to swing at him. He tried to duck and avoid the giant metal weapon, but with one eye he misjudged and caught a frying pan to the hip, which took him to the ground with an oomph. Stay down, you son of a bitch! I call the police! Mom! Bobby's mother stopped and hung the phone up. Bobby? Yes. God, Mom, I tried to tell you. He hit me with a frying pan. Well, you're supposed to be sleeping, not running around after midnight with a horrible mask on. Get upstairs and take that thing off. Then we're going to discuss an appropriate punishment for scaring the shit out of me. Yes, Mom. Bobby bowed his monstrous head and shuffled away. A sulking, misunderstood beast not unlike the one Dr. Frankenstein had made. That was Bobby's favorite book. His father had given it to him because it had been his favorite as well. When he got to the top of the stairs, Marco was standing outside his bedroom rubbing his tired eyes. What the hell's going on? He muttered. Bobby lifted his head to look at him and Marco jumped backward, falling into his door. Jesus, that's gruesome. Where the hell did you get that? Costume shop. How did you know it was me? Bro, you're still wearing the same clothes you were wearing when I picked you up earlier. They shared a laugh. Oh, right. So did you steal it or something? What? No, of course not. I went to the back door and the guy who works there let me in. It was so great. Just wait till you see all the cool stuff. Bobby! Their mother screamed from downstairs. You're tracking muddy footprints all over the house. Get those shoes off right now. You better clean this shit up. Sorry, Mom. He called back. She sounds pissed, dude, Marco said. You better get that mask off and do what she says, or you're going to end up grounded for Halloween. That would be a waste of a good costume. Bobby knew his brother was right. He sighed and grabbed the bottom of the mask. When he tried to tug it off, it wouldn't budge. He tried again, and it hurt. It felt like it was pulling on his face, like it was attached. He started to panic, breathing in quick breaths. It won't come off. What? Marco said. Stop fucking around. Just take it off before Mom comes up here. I'm serious, Bobby said with a whine. I can't get it off, Marco. It hurts. Something's wrong. That's ridiculous, Marco said. Come on. He grabbed the mask and tried to tug it free. He just pulled Bobby towards him by his head. Bobby screamed in agony. Blood started to trickle out the bottom of the mask onto Bobby's t-shirt. Stop, he cried. Stop, Marco, it hurts. Crap, it's like it's glued to your face or something. What did you put it on with? What do you mean? Bobby cried. I just slipped it on. I think your costume shop buddy just screwed you over, Bob. No, 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 no. Bobby was freaking out. Why? Why would he put glue in the mask? Why would he do that? I don't know, man. I don't know. Mom! Bobby gasped. Wait, no. Why are you calling Mom? She needs to take you to the hospital. No, I can't. She's going to be so mad. I have to go. Go where? Bobby. Bobby ran into his bedroom. He opened his window and climbed out onto the tree limb. He could hear his brother calling to his mother, saying he had gone outside. Bobby was angry. He felt betrayed. He tried to hurry, but he still couldn't see out of his left eye, and he tumbled from the tree, hitting the grass below with a smack. It wasn't much of a cushion, 
and he groaned in pain rolling around in the dirt. The front door flew open and his mom came crashing outside with his brother in tow. Bobby forced himself up. He was crying, but tears only fell out of the one red eye of his attached mask. He had to get back to Merrick, ask him what was happening, and find out what to do to stop it. Limping, he hurried around the house to grab his bicycle. His mother was pointing at him and yelling to his brother to get him. Marco was running at him as he pedaled away, wobbling side to side. Dude, come on, Marco called out running behind him. I have a car, Bob. You can't outrun me. Bobby didn't answer. He just kept pedaling and hoped he didn't fall and wreck. When he got to the alley behind the store, he let his bike fall. The wheels were still spinning behind him when he made it to the door. He banged on it frantically and got no answer. He banged more. Merrick! Merrick, please! I need help! Any moment, his brother would show up in his smoke-coughing car with his angry mother in the passenger seat. This was a horrible mess. His dream come true had turned into a nightmare. Bobby grabbed his bike and ran with it around to the front of the store. He leaned against the glass and peered within. The store was dark and still. Quiet. Dead. No, Bobby whimpered. Where is he? Where did he go? He heard the engine of his brother's car even before he saw it. Cursing, Bobby climbed back onto his bike and pedaled away. He didn't know where else to go, so he headed toward Arlo's house. As he rode, his phone rang repeatedly in his pocket. He knew it was his mom, so he didn't slow down. As it was, he expected to be grounded for life. When he got to his friend's house, Bobby went around the side to get out of sight from the road. He stood behind a large hedge and took his phone out. Arlo, it's me. I need you to sneak downstairs. I need help. Help with what, dude? It's the middle of the night. Please, give me a minute. I have to make sure my parents don't hear me. They'll kill me. Okay, I'm behind the hedge. I have a mask on, so don't freak out. A mask? What the hell's going on, Bobby? Just hurry. Okay. Bobby waited and waited. He saw through the hedge and watched his brother's car pass by twice. Pretty soon, they would come here and stop because they knew Arlo was his best friend. Bobby? A whispered voice said from behind him. He turned around and watched Arlo gasp and jump back in horror. Sorry, he said with a nervous chuckle. That mask is hideous. Caught me off guard. It's stuck. It won't come off. What? I'm serious. It's like attached to my face. I don't know what to do. And you think I do? Go to the hospital, man. My brother said the same thing. I don't think they can help me, though. And if they get me, they won't let me go. Why do you think I can help you and the hospital can't? It's attached, Bobby said. I cried through it. I bleed through it. If they cut it off, I think it'll take my face with it. That's horrible. I know. I don't know what to do. I don't either, Bobby. I'm sorry. Arlo had his head turned to the side. I can't even look at you right now. If I don't do something soon, this may be me forever. A door banged. There were footsteps. Arlo, are you out here? A voice called. Bobby knew his friend couldn't see it, but he was very afraid. I... I have to go, he said, taking his bike and riding off. I'm sorry, Arlo called behind him. When Bobby looked back, Arlo's parents were standing beside him. Bobby pedaled away into the night. He wished he knew where to go. He wasn't sure that anyone could help him. He still had his money in his pocket, and root beer always soothed his soul, so he rode to the grocery store. On his way there, people honked their horns and yelled at him from their car windows. Bobby couldn't hear them well, but caught the gist of it. They called him a freak and a monster. Bobby realized that he couldn't hear the passing cars or people on the side of the road well either. 
He used to hear everything, even when he didn't want to. It was strange that it had changed it so suddenly. He remembered the missing ear on the mask and wondered if that could have something to do with it. He tried to breathe out of his nose and it felt stuffed. No, squished. Hard for the air to get through. He had a moment of panic and tried once again to tear the mask free, but the bottom lip had somehow fused to his collarbone. There was no lip to pull. Bobby began to cry out of the mask's one good eye. His heart was racing, caught in the throes of panic. He ran his fingers over where the bottom of the mask should have been, and he felt a ridge. It went across his entire collarbone where the mask ended. It felt like bubbling scar tissue like the mask had been soldered to his body. But that was impossible, wasn't it? This whole thing was impossible. He parked his bike in the rack and went to the front doors where he was quickly stopped by employees. You gotta take the mask off before you go in. He followed their hands as they pointed to a sign. No masks or cloaks allowed in store. I can't take it off. Bobby pleaded, and you can't come in. No, I'm serious. Please, I just want a root beer. One young man stepped forward. He traced the mask, covering Bobby's face with his fingertips. Man, this is wicked. It's attached. I can't get it off. I'm scared. Are you sure it's mask? The girl beside the man said with a grimace. What if it's just his face? I'm not a monster, Bobby said. I just want root beer. Can I give you the money and you can go get it for me? No way, dude, the man said. I can't have you out here scaring away our customers. If you can't take off that mask, you can't be here. Please. The girl jumped in. If you don't leave, we'll be forced to call the police. The police? I just want a soda. Go. Bobby grabbed his bike and pedaled away, tears falling from his one eye as he went. There was a person walking on the sidewalk. Bobby moved to go around them, but they still jumped and yelped, dropping their coffee. I'm sorry, Bobby said as he passed them. A few minutes later, he got hit from the side and fell over, his bike sliding away. Bobby groaned. His lone eye was blurred. He looked up and saw several young men standing over him. What are you doing? He asked them. Shut up, freak, one of them said. Where did you crawl out of? Another asked as they nudged him with their foot. I'm just a kid. It's a mask. I got it from the costume shop. Costume shop doesn't open for days, a third person said. They sounded female. No way that's a mask. It's oozing something. You're fucking gross, freak. It's supposed to be scary. It's for Halloween. Please. Please what? Don't hurt me. Let me go. You think it's contagious? First man asked. I know if it is. I don't want it, said the female. We need to make sure no one else gets it. Put this freak in a truck. No. Bobby scrambled to his feet. He kicked one man between the legs, or at least he hoped he did with his blurred vision, and he squeezed by him. He took off running, abandoning his bicycle. He pumped his arms and churned his legs, hoping they didn't give chase. Then he saw the truck. They were yelling at him from the open windows. Bobby felt like his heart was going to explode. He had no idea how things had gone so bad so fast. He had to figure out how to get this mask off, or his life was going to be ruined. He couldn't even go in the grocery store. People were treating him like a monster. He wouldn't be able to go to school. This was the worst day of his life. It was Merrick's fault. The man had to have known what would happen. But that meant he could probably reverse it if only Bobby could find him. Before he could do anything, though, he had to lose the people in the truck that was swerving back and forth in its effort to run him over. He couldn't even look around for a good place to hide. He could barely see. If they weren't screaming and gunning the engine, he wouldn't have been able to hear them either. 
he wasn't ready to die. He hoped an opportunity would just present itself. It was all he had. He just kept running. Then he wasn't. His foot had caught something and sent him sprawling forward, his arms windmilling out at his sides. He cried out and hit the street hard enough to roll. When he looked up, that truck full of violence was barreling towards him. Bobby screamed. Then a car hit the truck in the side and drove it into a parked car. The crash was loud and metal dented in on itself. Steam and smoke rose from the crumpled heaps. People were groaning and whining. Bobby stood and brushed himself off as he looked at the wreckage in shock. It was his brother's car that had hit the truck and made it crash. Marco had saved him. But at what cost? Bobby walked slowly over broken glass that crunched under his feet as he approached the mess that was once a muscle car. The smoke was not only coming from the muffler this time. Bobby reached the car and looked in. His brother was pitched forward, forehead on the steering wheel. He was bleeding. Beside him was their mother. She was slumped forward, head hanging and blood soaking her clothes. Mom, Bobby said. Mom, I'm so sorry. There was no response. He took his phone out and called the police. There's been a terrible wreck. My mom and my brother are hurt bad. Please come help. Bobby tried not to cry as he gave them the information that they asked for. When they said they were on their way, he hung up and returned his phone to his pocket. He knew he couldn't be there when the cops got there. The way things were going, they would have shot him for looking like a monster. They would certainly tell him to remove his mask. He didn't know what they would do when he told them he couldn't. Maybe they would kill him. Maybe they would arrest him. There was no scenario he could think of where things ended well. And so, he ran. He knew even if his mom and brother made it out of this alive, they would be going to the hospital. That meant home was once again a safe space, at least for tonight. He didn't stop running until he got there. When he went in and closed the door behind himself, he slid down to the floor and let out all the tears he had been holding in. He sobbed for his mother, his brother, and himself. When it was all out of his system, he got up and went to the bathroom where he stood before the mirror and took in the true horror of himself for the first time. He saw what others saw, what they feared, and were repulsed by. The mask had been horrifying when he had held it in his hands, but it was so much worse now that it pulled itself so tightly over him that it had become his face. The cheekbones protruded like daggers, and the bone of the forehead with its etched center was a deeper, more pronounced ridge. The cuts oozed real pus and slime. He touched it with his fingers to be sure. The teeth that had punched through the cheeks of the mask came to razor points. How could I ask anyone not to be afraid of me? I'm afraid of me. Maybe if he waited until the same time of night that he met Merrick tonight, he could meet him again. He would make the man change him back. Whatever magic he used to make Bobby this way had to be reversible. If it wasn't, Bobby was certain that he would lose his mind. He left the evil in the mirror and went to his bedroom where he lay down and his protruding teeth punched holes in his pillow. He moaned and screamed out to God. Then he hugged himself and fell asleep. When he woke up in the morning, Bobby knew he couldn't go anywhere, not until nightfall. He called the hospital to check on his mother and brother. There was no information. They were in the ICU. His brother had been rushed in for surgery. At least they were alive, he thought. He made himself a bowl of cereal and found when he went to eat it that the monster mask moved. It opened and closed like a real mouth. Chewing was strange, but he was so hungry that he forced to make it work. Twice he bit the spoon with the jagged array of teeth. He tried using Vaseline, cooking oil, and lard to try to remove the mask. Nothing worked. It was no different at this point than trying to remove your own face. What have I done? He thought maybe it wouldn't be able to withstand a hot shower, but he was wrong. 
He tried to slice the mask with a knife just to see if he could see his own face beneath it, but cutting the mask caused him terrible pain and he cried out, dropping the knife. Bobby did everything he could until nightfall. Then he put on a hoodie and did his best to cover his hideous face. He didn't have a bike anymore, so he left on foot. He passed all the houses decorated for the coming holiday. The holiday he had always loved and waited eagerly for that was now the bane of his existence. He tromped his way angrily to the costume shop. He went straight to the back and banged on the door. It didn't open at first, but just like the last time, right when he was about to give up and leave, the back door flew open. The odd yellow light shined forth. Merrick, he called. The man appeared and smiled at him, taking a bow. Bobby, dear boy, are you enjoying being a monster? No, this is terrible. People think I'm really a monster. I can't get the mask off. My family got hurt. Well, that last part is truly awful. I'm sorry. The last part? All of it. It's all awful. What kind of sick joke is this? Why would you do this to me? Oh, Bobby, I didn't do this to you. You did, boy. You walked through the wish light and you said, and I quote, I want to be the scariest monster in here. I meant for Halloween, Bobby screamed. Well, you will be. Do you think this is funny? Change me back. You change me back right now. I'm afraid I can't do that, Bobby. There is only one wish allowed per customer. I'm sorry. I have to go get things prepared now. We open our doors tomorrow. It's official. You're not going anywhere until you turn me back. I'm sorry, my boy, but I can't do that. This is who you are now. Bobby roared and charged him. He tackled him to the ground and opened his mouth overstuffed with jagged teeth and he opened it wider than he ever would have thought himself capable. Then he sank those teeth into Merrick's throat. He tore it free with a spray of blood that painted the unmarked door. You see? Merrick said with a cough as he held a hand to his neck and slid down the wall. I told you. This is you now. There's no going back. Back, Bobby. You have blood on you. You are a monster. Bobby wanted to scream no. He wanted to say Merrick was wrong, but he knew he couldn't, so he just dove back in and let those razor teeth finish the job before he took off into the night. I hope you enjoyed The Costume Shop, as written by Keisto Healy and performed by Paul J. McSorley. Keisto Healy started writing as a child, and it was always his biggest passion, though he is also a musician and artist. When he was forced to quarantine in March 2020 due to the pandemic, he decided to focus on his writing and write full-time, and has since had 100 stories accepted to be published many of which are already out there. He hopes this is only the beginning. Actor Paul J. McSorley can be found right here on our own very network. Check out over 120 episodes on Fear from the Heartland. He also has a large collection of audiobooks, which you can peruse at paulsbooks.net. That's P-A-U-L-S-B-O-O-K-S dot net. On to the shows. Longtime resident and powerhouse Otis Jiry has his very own show here on our network, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, which you can hear every Sunday night. We also have Eric Peabody's Horror Hill, a podcast dedicated to some of our deeper and darker tales. We hope you check him out. Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Fridays, featuring some southern down-home horror. And of course, 
Steve Taylor will be here again on Monday to bring you more frightening fiction. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host for this evening, Paul J. McSorley, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs>